If you live in a place that has hot, sunny summers, you're probably used to seeing mirages on roads, those things that look like puddles or ponds with ripples on the water surface. And that's probably the simple and most commonly seen mirage. It's called an inferior mirage. In this video, we're going to look at inferior mirages, as well as the more spectacular superior mirages and the mythical Fata Morgana type mirages. The inferior mirage is indeed very common, and the images you're seeing are from the road that I actually live on, hardly an exotic place or situation. You can imagine, though, if you were dying of thirst in the middle of a desert and probably somewhat delusional from the heat, and then seeing what looks like water only to have it disappear as you got close, well, that could easily drive someone crazy. So what causes an inferior mirage? And why does the water evaporate as soon as we get close? Well, we can get a clue if we look at the road with a thermal imaging camera. You can see the temperature of the road's surface after baking in the sun all day is as much as 40 Celsius or 70 Fahrenheit hotter than the surrounding air temperature, which was probably in the mid-20s or close to 80 for you Fahrenheit people. Well, if the road is hot enough to fry an egg like that, it'll also heat up the air immediately above it, making it just slightly less dense, thinner, than the cooler air even further above its surface. And the light waves can travel just slightly faster through that hot air. That increase in speed bends the path that the light takes towards the slower or slightly cooler, thicker air. And that's the same sort of thing you can see when you see heat shimmering above a toaster. And indeed, we can do an experiment with a toaster and a laser pointer, or in my case, the laser and an IR thermometer, to see just how much heat actually causes light to bend. If we set up things so the laser beam passes just along the boundary between the hot rising toaster air and the cooler room temperature air, it does indeed bend away from the hot air. But not very much, even after traveling a distance of about 100 feet or 30 meters across my basement, the deflection from the heat is rarely beyond half an inch or about one centimeter. We can use a bit of trigonometry and figure out the angle, which turns out to be only a tiny fraction of a degree. The deflection is there, but it really is minimal. And why is it so minimal? Well, if we look at the index of refraction of different materials, and all the index of refraction is, is how much a material slows down the speed of light from its normal speed in a vacuum, we can see that air hardly slows down light at all. And if that difference in index of refraction is so small to start with, think of how tiny the difference is between the index of refraction of room temperature air and slightly warmer air. So bending of light that creates mirages is limited to a very shallow angle because of that minuscule change in index of refraction. So we only see reflections at a distance where that shallow bend is enough to bend incoming light waves in a direction so that they shine onto our eyes and we can see them. In the end, it looks like a reflection on the water surface because the uneven moving layers of air does a good job imitating the reflections we would get from the ripples on the surface of something like a pond. And like water or a mirror, the reflection is upside down. You can often see that nicely by looking at the reflection of a car and its headlights in the mirage. These minor mirages are not confined to roads or deserts. They're actually quite common over water, but we generally only notice them if we can see something like a shoreline for them to reflect. Here's a spectacular one I saw from Fort Myers Beach in Florida one winter. The flying saucer is actually a bridge, the bottom of the saucer being a reflection of the top of the bridge. Of course, all I had was a cell phone to take a picture with, so I didn't get the ability to zoom in and take the picture I would love to have captured. Like in the case of a hot summer road, the water must have been warmer than the air above it, creating that warm layer of air on its surface. It was a winter morning, so it's not surprising we had that sort of temperature situation. Now, that's nice, but look at this. This photo of an iceberg was taken by Simon Engels. 
a photographer on Vancouver Island. She knew something was up because you don't get icebergs anywhere close to Vancouver. The climate in that area is much more like what you might expect in the UK or the nearby coastal areas of Europe. Well, that iceberg turned out to be the snow-covered peak of the Sheem Mountains, a bit over 100 miles away, and that is normally well below the horizon. If we look at Google Satellite, we can see where Simone took her photo somewhere near Nanus Bay on Vancouver Island, and Mount Sheem is way inland, again about 100 miles or more away. The mirage would have looked like an iceberg somewhere around here in the Strait of Georgia, between the bay and Vancouver itself. Indeed, the light from the peak of Mount Sheem would have had to travel across the Fraser Valley and over Vancouver. If we look at Street View and compare the mountains with the iceberg, it looks like what we're seeing as the iceberg was about the top 10% of Mount Sheem. Well, let's figure out what's happening. We'll use a rounded surface to represent the Earth's surface, and we'll show Simon's camera on the left at Nanus Bay, and we can draw in a horizon line from there, and we can also draw in Vancouver, and it turns out that the tallest buildings in Vancouver would indeed be below the horizon from that point where she took the photo. We can also draw in Mount Sheem, and its summit at a little over 2,000 meters is also below the horizon. We can calculate how far away the horizon is from the vantage point of the camera, and to make things easy, the thing to do is to go to one of many websites that does this calculation online. Anyway, it turns out that the horizon is about six kilometers away from a camera that's three meters above sea level. Since we know how far the horizon is from the camera, we can also figure out how far that point is from Mount Sheem and from Vancouver. And with that, we can use our horizon calculator in reverse to figure out how high Mount Sheem would have to be if its peak was just touching the horizon, and it turns out it would needed to have been 2,372 meters high if its peak was just barely visible to the camera. So since we figured out that what the iceberg is is the top 10% of Mount Sheem, We'll draw that in at the horizon point in the middle of the Strait of Georgia. So that's the iceberg. And what we can do is draw in a line from the camera through that peak over to where the real Mount Sheem is. And you can see it's considerably above Mount Sheem's real peak. So what we'll do is draw in a floating Mount Sheem with its peak in the correct position. And we should probably draw in some air. So for the superior mirage, we will have warm, thin upper atmosphere air and cool, dense air on the surface, probably trapped around Vancouver and in the Fraser River Valley. And we can also try and draw in how the light would bend so that light from the peak of the real Mount Sheem appears to line up with the peak of the iceberg in the middle of the Strait of Georgia. And as expected, it's clearly bending downwards towards the cooler, dense, thick air. Now what we can do is draw in a triangle representing roughly the distance between Mount Sheem and Vancouver and how much the mirage would have had to lift the peak of Mount Sheem and we'll move that triangle over here where there's some more space. And since we knew the iceberg was the top 10% of Mount Sheem, we can write in that what we're seeing is about 210 meters of Mount Sheem. If we take the 232 meter additional elevation needed for Mount Sheem, plus the 210 meters above the horizon, that the peak of the iceberg appears to be, well, it turns out we would have to raise Mount Sheem by 442 meters or 0.442 kilometers to get things to line up. And the other side of the triangle is 100 kilometers representing the distance of Mount Sheem to Vancouver. So if we pretend that all the bending were to occur over Vancouver, 
well, we can put in an angle alpha and we can do the calculation and see that the total bending of the light would have been less than a degree. In other words, a minuscule amount of bending in the light. And that's what we've come to expect from the ability of warm to cool air bending light because the index of refraction differences are so small. Now, in reality, it's not being bent entirely over Vancouver. Indeed, as we've shown in the diagram, it bends over a much longer distance. So, in fact, the incremental bending is probably even less than that. Well, that's how this beautiful superior mirage image was formed. So that leaves the most mythical of all mirage phenomena, the Fata Morgana, the Italian for Morgan Le Fay, a sorceress or enchantress in the King Arthur legends. There seems to be varying definitions of exactly what it is, but I think the best definition that makes the most sense is a mirage made up of multiple layers of air of different temperatures or just two layers with varying temperature gradients in the transition region between those layers. In the end, rather than a uniform reflection or bending of light as with the inferior or superior mirages, here you might get multiple images in varying orientations and where the temperature gradients happen to form a lens-like structure, weird magnifications that, that distort and stretch distant objects, often wobbling them over time. One of my friends does a lot of nature photography around Lake Ontario, and he took this photo of Kingston, Ontario. That blurry horizontal stripe is the significantly vertically stretched shoreline, so this would have been a very simple Fata Morgana type mirage. It turns out that Lake Ontario is actually renowned for this sort of image. My brother Nick, who lives in Vancouver, took these two photos in the British Columbia coastal areas. It's a bit hard to tell if this is a true Farda Morgana or a very prominent inferior mirage, although this one in the Vancouver Harbour area really looks like the ship has been weirdly stretched vertically. For comparison, here's the same ship a bit later from a different angle. So with this video almost at an end, I'd like to show you one more mirage in one of the photos we've already looked at and you may not have noticed. It's over here on the other side of the iceberg photo. The mountain you see is Mount Baker, an active volcano just south of the Canada-US border. In photos of Vancouver, it's often looming ominously in the background and seems larger than it should be. I've often thought that there probably was some sort of mirage or optical effect going on, and I did the same sort of calculations for this photo as we did for Mount Sheem. Unlike Mount Sheem, Mount Baker would normally be visible above the horizon, but in this photo, it's about twice as high as it should be. So the same type of superior mirage effect is actually taking place, making it way more prominent in this photo than it would be under normal conditions. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you made it this far, you might like some of the other videos I've been creating. So please consider subscribing. It really makes a huge difference for a small channel like this one. There should also be a couple of links floating around somewhere up here that YouTube thinks you might also enjoy. So go ahead and click on them too, and see you next time.